Hello, I'm Sean with Medieval Collectibles, and today we're going to talk about swords. This sword in particular. This is our Marshall Damascus sword as made by Cass Hanway. And today we're going to talk a little bit about its material, its geometry, as well as its history. So let's start with that. This sword is based on an arming sword, also known as a knightly sword, that's currently located in the Wallace Collection in London, England. What's interesting about this sword is that when it was originally found, it was found in what can only be defined as remarkable condition. Dare I say it might even be defined as pristine. Um, when it was discovered, it had almost no pitting, and there were only touches of roughness that could be discerned on the point, um, in addition to the sort of bluish purple patina that the whole blade featured. Now this sword is named after Sir William Marshall. He was a famous figure from English history. He was the first Earl of Pembroke and he's perhaps most notable for being defined as what historians would call the greatest knight who ever lived. He also served five English kings, and they were Henry II, the first king he served. He also served Henry II's three sons, the young King Henry, that's his nickname, Richard I, who's also famously known as Richard the Lionheart, and King John, also known as King John Lackland, who's basically been made famous by the Robin Hood stories. The last king he served was Henry III, who was John's son. Now you may be asking, what defined William Marshall as the greatest knight who ever lived? Well, part of it was based on his skill in battle. He initially started as a tutor in arms to the young King Henry, but he earned his reputation fighting in tournaments. He was famous for winning them. In fact, he made his reputation based on it. On his deathbed, Marshall recalled besting 500 knights total. He was also a crusader. He crusaded from about 1183 to 1185 or 1186. Another claim to fame that he has is he is the only man who can claim to have unhorsed Richard the Lionheart. This happened in about 1186 when Richard was being particularly rebellious against his father, Henry II. It's an interesting story. Um, Marshall actually could have killed Richard at that point, but he intentionally targeted Richard's horse, which resulted in then Prince being unhorsed, and Richard was very aware of the fact that Marshall could have killed him, but chose to be merciful instead. Sadly, despite the fact that this sword is named after him, there is no conclusive evidence that he used a sword that was exactly like this. However, due to its status as an iconic sword of the knight, it carries his name, likely because he would have used one that was very similar to it. Having served five kings over the course of his life, it's obvious that William Marshall had a very eventful career, both as a politician and as a warrior. We could spend days talking about his exploits. But instead, let's move on and start talking about this sword. This sword is an Oakshot Type 10A, which is best known for possessing a strong blade, nice and thick and powerful, as well as a long fuller that runs the length from the hilt almost entirely to the point. It's got some profile taper, as you can see by it narrowing slightly and then abruptly coming down to a fine thrusting point, as well as some distal taper. Um, it's thinner at the point than it is here at the grip. And again, that leads it some control and some responsiveness when it's being wielded. The edge is hollow ground. Basically what that means is that when you're coming here, it has a slight concave shape that comes down to a very fine edge. Hollow ground edges tend to be extremely sharp. They're very good for cutting. The sword itself is made from K120C steel. You may be asking, what is K120C steel? It's a powdered steel. Basically that means whenever they're producing it for use, it's powdered and atomized, solidified, and then put into a canister, heated and pressed into a billet, and then it's ready for use. Functionally, it behaves similarly to 1095 carbon steel. The sword has a Damascus pattern. In fact, it has two. It features lined striations along the edge, and then the fuller features a very elegant sort of eye of the hurricane pattern. It's very distinctive. As they are hand folded, if you do order this sword, yours may feature some differentiations in the pattern, but that just makes each one unique and special. The blade has been hardened to a Rockwell of 54, and it's hand-tempered and fully functional. You can tell by kind of I'm gently resting it here in my hand, I can tell you it is also very sharp. The handle is made from wood, wrapped and laced in black leather to ensure a nice solid grip when you're holding it. And whenever you're holding it, 
it indexes very well. You can easily tell where the edge is going, again, by the oval shape. It's designed as a one-handed sword. Obviously, I don't have a whole lot of room to put my second hand. Just enough that if I need extra leverage, I can get my hand around the pommel, but for the most part, it's designed to be used just with one, so you can have a shield on this arm. The cross guard is of a traditional cruciform shape, providing a little bit of defense, and then the pommel is a disc shape. Again, it fits very nicely into the hand in case you need to get extra leverage. For the most part, it's just a very nice counterbalance. The tang is full length of the hilt as well and peened at the pommel for added durability, and also ensures that the blade won't rattle or come loose if you do happen to be engaging in combat or doing cutting drills. The sword also includes a scabbard that's wrapped in black leather, made in wood, and it features seal fittings at the throat and at the tip. Now that we've got geometry and form out of the way, let's talk a little bit about how the sword performs, specifically where its point of percussion is. On this sword, the point of percussion is about 22 to 23 inches up the blade. So about right there. And again, as you can see, when I strike it, the point of percussion, there's very little wobble. As an example for when it's not the point of percussion, there's discernible wobble when the blade hits. There, the blade stays very steady and absorbs most of the force. The sword's point of balance rests about six inches from the guard. So right about there. This is a fine sword that any swordsman or historical European martial arts practitioner would be eager to get in hand and use either for combat or for cutting drills or just general practice. As always, we'd like to thank you for your time. We'd appreciate it if you like and subscribe, and we'll see you in the next video.